Hey, we're so excited about today. We are in part three of a collection that we've titled Jesus Is. Man, this collection has been amazing, hasn't it? If you missed it, you can go back and check it out. Today, we have a very special speaker for you. If it wasn't for him, the church probably wouldn't be here today. It is our founding pastor, my dad. Would you guys help us welcome Pastor Danny Elcori? Somebody shout glory. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It's a good day, isn't it? Is it a good day? Well, someone say with me, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated when you get ready to. I don't ever tell anyone what to do. I just make a few suggestions. But um, it's good to be here. I'm very thankful for Pastor Eli and Pastor Sheridan for making a way, making it possible that I could bring the word this morning. Uh, this this word's been stewing on my heart for at least 30 days, been boiling over, and I just can't wait to get it spit out. Now, don't worry about the spit. If you get spit on, it's anointed, so don't. It's just like getting hit with anointing oil. You'll be all right. Um, y'all see this bottle of Fiji? I don't I don't buy Fiji much for myself because it's just kind of high dollar. But I got a dear friend right back in the back, Miss Laura Hobson. She brings me a Fiji water every Sunday. Whether I'm preaching or not, she thinks I need it, and I'm glad she does. Amen? Normally, it's frozen solid, but uh, this one here is it's very cold, though. Amen? And uh, we have a guest here today from the big town of Brinkman, Oklahoma. Anyone ever heard of Brinkman? Didn't think you did. It's a population of one. My sister Debbie's here from Brinkman, Oklahoma. That's over there by Willow. You probably know where Willow is, or Jester. Or Jay Buckle. Never mind. We're going to stop that, okay? <laughs> We're going to move on. Well, isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? I could have been in the finest prison in the country, but I'm here. Amen? I'm glad to be here. We have been in a collection. This is the third week of this collection of Jesus Is. The first week was Jesus Is the Son of God. The second week was Jesus Is the Son of Man. And this week... We're going to try to go just a little bit deeper. Is it okay to go a little deeper? Yeah. Say a little bit deeper. In the well, boys. Oh, that's them. We're going to go a little bit deeper. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the Lord. Some say, I know that. Others say, well, what do you mean? Well, many people declare Jesus as their Savior. They say that when I die, I'm going to heaven because Jesus saved me. Are you with me now? Jesus came to this earth to save the lost. Matthew chapter 10 verse 6. And the truth is that we are all born lost. We are all born without Christ. And we all need a savior. We need someone to have paid the price for our sin. And we know Jesus as our savior. We know Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. But today we're going to learn and we're going to know, if we don't already, that Jesus is the Lord of all. You see, when Jesus is the Lord of our lives, that means he leads us, he guides us, and we walk within the perimeters of his word to the best of our ability. Whether we believe it or not, he is Lord. And his will will be done. All prophecy will be fulfilled. The end of time will be as he said it will be. As we leave this place that we call time and enter into the place of eternity where time doesn't count, where time just goes on and on and on, it too will be as Jesus said it will be. The biblical definition for the word Lord is one possessing authority, power, and control. The word of God describes Jesus as the head of the church, the ruler over all creation, 
the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. One of the ways that I've been able to establish this in my mind and establish this in my heart and be able to get a full grip of things is to look at a landlord. Everyone know what a landlord is? A landlord is someone who owns a piece of property, whether it be land or whether it be a home or, or a building or just some piece of property that has value to it and someone, and they make it available for someone to lease. A landlord designs an agreement agreement a lease agreement that will satisfy his plans for that property and his desires for that property the tenant is then expected to adhere to the guidelines of the lease and if the tenant is in violation of this lease he is in danger of and probably will be evicted see sometimes we sign a lease and we have no intention of adhering to the lease. Or we signed the lease and we didn't realize there was a due date. Or how much was due. Or where to send it. Now, if I'm talking to you, just look straight forward and don't want to pay attention. But when Jesus is in our lives, we make him the Lord. In other words, what his word says, how we're to live and what we're to do and what he has for us needs to become final word in our lives. Therefore, he is the Lord of our life because it doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter how many times it's happened this way or that way. We need to stand upon the word of God and we declare and we decree it's going to be as according to what God has said because he is the Lord of my life. He might not be the Lord of someone else's life that it didn't turn out that way for them, but he is the Lord of my life and it's going to be according to his word for me. Somebody say amen. We love him and we choose him. He called us to be who we are. We honor his word and we honor his ways when he's our Lord. See, whenever we no longer are a tenant of a piece of property, when we have been evicted, we have been removed, we're no longer called the tenant and therefore the landlord is no longer called your landlord. So if we're in the kingdom of God and we do not honor his word and we do not walk in his principles, we do not adhere to his teachings, then we are no longer considered faithful believers because we are not considering him Lord. If he's Lord, we do as our Lord tells us John chapter 18 verse 1 says when Jesus had spoken these words he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered and Judas who betrayed him also knew the place for Jesus often met there with his disciples then Judas having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, he went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered and said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am him, or I am he. And Jesus, Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with him. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. When Jesus said, I am he, there was power and there was authority that came from him. See, when Moses asked God, who will I tell sent me, he said, I tell them I am. Jesus said, I am. That power that Jesus possessed was unlimited power. In that army group, it is said that there are between 300 and 660 soldiers. These were well-trained soldiers. These were, this wasn't a bunch of Boy Scouts. 
It wasn't a bunch of secret service. Excuse me. These were well-trained soldiers. And they knew how to capture. They knew how to kill. They were well-armed. But he showed them a glimpse of his power when he said, I am. And they did what? They stepped back and they fell to the ground. He could have killed them all had he wanted to. He showed them that their power against him, no matter how mighty it was, was powerless against him. Then they asked him again, or he asked again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you. That sounds that sound like a scolding, doesn't it? How many times your mama, you say, I've already told you. Or your daddy, I already told you. Bring the belt. I'm leaving. I have told you that I'm he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. See, Jesus was saying, I'm here to lay my life down. I'm here to be the sacrifice. I'm here to be the Savior. I'm here to be the sacrificial lamb. The only reason that you can capture me or take me with you is because I have laid my life down. The sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb, the Savior, the one and only who could pay the price. And he said, let these go their way. He's saying, I am the good shepherd. I stand in for them. Let them go their way. Verse 10, then verse 9, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Verse 10, then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. The Bible tells us that Peter was a fisherman. What was a fisherman doing with a sword? You would think he might have a Zebco 33 or something, right? What was the fisherman doing with a sword? Verse 11, so Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Peter, they're, they're not taking me against my will. That's what I came here for. I came here to be the sacrifice. I'm gladly giving my life for you and for all those who believe. Shall I not drink this cup that my father has given me? These people are not in charge. They're not the ones in control. I am the Lord of all. This is what Jesus is telling them. In Luke chapter 22 verse 49 when those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike them with a sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, permit even this. In other words, let them take me. And he touched his ear and healed him. Peter pulled his sword and cut off the right ear of Malchus. Do you think he was aiming at the right ear? I mean, a fisherman with a sword? But that's what he got. And Jesus said, no more of this. In other words, don't resist anymore. And he picked up the ear. And he healed Malchus. Now think about this. When you get cut, or when you, if you were to get a finger or toe or something like that cut off, would healing automatically mean it was put back on and it was put back on like it had never happened? Usually we just, when you heal from having your tonsils taken out, do they put the tonsils back in? No. It heals. But what God, God Jesus, did when he put the ear back on and it healed it back on perfectly, 
He not only healed him, but he restored him back to his natural look. What Peter did was a high crime. What he did could have got him executed. But when Jesus placed the ear back upon Malchus and restored it and healed it, it hid, it hid all evidence that a violation had ever been made. That shows that through the life of Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, the sins of our past have been paid for and they're no longer There's no longer evidence of this. That was a time to shout. Come on, somebody. I know I'm not the only one that sinned before. But the evidence of all our sin has been hidden, has been washed away by the blood of Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Therefore God also has highly exalted him, And given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Of those in heaven and on earth and those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Lord is the highest name that can be given. That name was given to Jesus. He's Lord. And he's Lord of all. If Jesus in our lives doesn't become Lord of everything in our life, Lord of our spiritual life, Lord of our mental life, what are we feeding our mind? Do we feed our mind the Word of God, Romans chapter 12? Is He the Lord of our mind, our physical life? Where do we spend our time? What do we do? Is He the Lord of our physical life? Socially, is He the Lord of our social life? And I I like to use marriage in the social realm. But socially, is Jesus the center of our marriage? Is the word of God the foundation of our marriage? Financially, is Jesus the Lord of our finances? Or do we give him our spirit, our mind, our physical bodies, our social life? But Jesus, get your hands off my money. Do we hold that back? Or is he the Lord of our finances? Are we committing those things with our finances as the Lord's word says to? Are we doing something unholy with what God calls holy? What we have before us today, the song that we just experienced praising and worshiping called another one is a biblical song the words that are spoken in this are according to the word of God they have to do with the past they can have to do with the present and they can have to do with the future see God's word is eternal God's word doesn't stop he does, it doesn't matter to him if, if this is the third Friday of the month and, you know, we don't do anything on the third Friday of the month. God's word continues. It rolls on. It does what he sent it to do. So we're going to unpack this a little bit. We're going to see what it is in this word that should and will bring us hope for the future. Because you know without hope, your spirit dies. Your, your mental realm, your, your mind, your will and emotions, it dies. It loses. You got to have hope. We have to be a people with hope. I know the world is getting darker out there. But we, as the children of God, ought to have hope and we should be getting lighter. The light of God should be shining brighter in us Day by day as the world grows darker and darker. Many praise and worship songs out there. I'm not saying here. I'm on the radio and stuff. If you'll listen to them, 
print the words off, check them out, see if they're biblical. There are some songs that they call Christian songs that are not biblical. They don't line up with the Word of God. This song does. So let's start. You do everything on purpose. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. He does everything on purpose. Everything he does is on purpose for his purpose. We are here as children of God for the purpose of God. We are here to do what he purposes us to do. I know some people say, well, we're here on purpose for a purpose. No, for a purpose? No, we're here according to his purpose to fulfill his purpose for our lives. He has plans for us, and his plans are bigger for us than we have for ourselves. We need to think bigger. And I don't just mean bigger to the glory of our, I'm not talking about bigger to the glory of ourselves. I'm talking think bigger to the glory of God. Because God can do more with one verse than we can with all the words in the world. I can feel your spirit stirring. I've been praying and you've been working. See, sometimes we need to take a physical action with the words we speak. I can feel your spirit stirring. See, sometimes we just, we just have to walk it out. I feel your spirit stirring. The spirit of God is in this house. Why do I know it's in this house? Because this is the house of God and we are the children of God and his spirit lives inside of us. Therefore, his spirit is here and his spirit isn't asleep. His spirit hadn't gone to the sixth row back there and took a nap. His spirit is stirring. So look at your neighbors. They get it stirring. You know, sometimes we got to give room for the Spirit. You know, sometimes we don't want to do anything for the Spirit because we want everything to live. Sometimes we need to let go of that civilized and become uncivilized to the kingdom and to the glory of God. Let His Spirit flow in us. It's okay to dance. It's okay to sing. Even though there was times that that my wife Lori would be standing next to each other and there'd be a song that I really like and I'd just start to belling it out and she, she'd tap me on the leg, you know. And I'd look over there and she'd go. <laughs> Talking about the Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 17, and it came to pass in the last days, says God. Now, we're, now this scripture is coming up. This is also, this is, all of this scripture that we're reading and that we're going through with this, with this um, message here, it pertains to the past, the present, and the future. Because there's no date stamp on the word of God. So when we, we go in here and say, it should come to pass in the last days, says God. You know, a lot of people say, well, that's for the last days. Well, but whenever you look at the condition of the world, you say it's the last days. So why can't it be the last days with this? Just keep looking straight. <laughs> that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Our sons and our daughters should be prophesying. We should be prophesying. What does it mean to prophesy? It means speak the word of God over the situation. We're, we may not all be prophets. May not be any of us in this room that's a prophet. But we can prophesy. We can speak the word of God over our condition and our situations. Your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. I told someone here a while back, I said, I've seen a vision. They said, there's no way. I said, what do you mean? It says young men see, <laughs> see visions, and old men dream dreams. I said, well, I don't dream, but I do. And all my men servants and all my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. 
See, when we prophesy, when we speak the word of God over our situations, over our loved ones, and over, over the conditions of this world, when we prophesy speaking God's word over it, we're witnessing that the Spirit of God is in us. It's proof that the Spirit of God is in us. You're working it all for good. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. That's what we're here for. We're called according to his purpose. So fan the flame and keep it burning. You're refining in the furnace. Fan the flame. I love to do that whenever the worship team is it was get, getting, getting smoking. I like, uh, fan that flame. Let her burn, baby, let her burn. Let's let the Spirit of the Lord burn, baby, burn. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 9 says, I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name. This is us. They will call on my name, and I will answer them, and I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. Amen. All the waiting will be worth it because you're working it all for good. Psalms chapter 27 verse 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. As we wait on the Lord, that time is not being wasted. As we wait on the Lord, we're not asleep. As we wait on the Lord... We got the word of God out. We got our face in the word of God. We're studying his word. We're wanting to hear a now word. Because the wait is not a time to waste. Our God's not a waster. Anyone know our God's a Jew? He don't waste. He don't throw nothing away. So when we talk about waiting in the Bible, that's not like sitting down sleeping forever. Waiting is trusting on it to come Trusting the word of God that it will manifest and we wait for it to manifest. But in the meantime, we're renewing our mind according to the word. Miracle after miracle, open door after open door. Revelation 3.8, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. God has set an open door before you. You got an open door. Sometimes I think we pray for things and we don't give God an opportunity to, to let us see it how he wants us to see it. See, like if you're pay, praying for patience, God may allow something to come into your life that you need to take patience with. You pray, God, I need the money to pay my rent this month. God may provide an avenue for you to go to work and pay your rent. Oh, no, not that way. If you're praying to have a good marriage, God may provide you an opportunity to do something constructive in your marriage. He may provide you a way to do something godly in your marriage. Here it comes. So get ready for another one. Because another one is on the way. See, God has already performed miracle after miracle in our lives. God is performing miracles in our lives today. He's going to continue to perform miracles in our lives. Some people may say, well, I've just never had a miracle. My life's just been a whole hump. Well, you've probably had the most miracles because nothing has ever happened to you. You didn't see it. God stopped it before it ever happened. That's a miracle in itself. Miracle after miracle. Open door after open door. Here it comes, so get ready for another one, because another one is on the way. A year ago last night, Lori, my wife, Axel, Pastor Eli, Pastor Sheridan, and myself experienced a miracle. Earlier that day, the tips of Axel's fingers, two of his fingers got cut off. We had to take him to the hospital in, in Oklahoma City, OU Medical. They, we didn't get out of that hospital until after 11, and we had called Sheridan and Eli. They were out of town, and we called them and said, y'all need to come home. They came home. After we left the hospital, we went straight to the airport, picked them up, 
We needed to go to the convenience store on North Meridian. I don't remember what it was we needed there. It might have needed a big gulp. I don't know. We go to that convenience store, and then when we leave, going north out on Meridian, and I turn to go east on I-40. When I turned to go east on I-40, you know, took the, the on-ramp, I should say. Some people think I went to a four-way stop. Took the on-ramp. I looked. Well, of course, all I could see is lights, kind of like right up here. I mean, all I could see is lights. So all I, I just, just keep on going my steady speed and enter into the road. Well, that was before I had cataract surgery. Now, now, now they don't do this. I got on the road, and I looked in that rearview mirror, and the headlights of a semi was in the window of that Lincoln Navigator. That's how close it came that I could have just, I could have hit right into it, or he could have been going faster and could have rear-ended us. It was a miracle. I saw that in that rear view mirror, and I'm going to tell you, I began to thank God for that miracle. But at the same time, I was so ashamed and so embarrassed, I didn't tell anyone for over a week. Finally, over a week later, I told Eli and Sheridan and Lori, we had a miracle that night. Every one of us could have ended up dead very easily. But God, and he'll do it again. O oh, rushing wind and living water. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. John seven thirty seven. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me... As the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This happened in the past, it's happening today, and it's going to keep on happening. God has, by the power of his Holy Spirit, has come and it, is, it has caused a rushing mighty wind. And see, one time I, I told Lord, I said, I think I've heard of rushing mighty wind. She said, yeah, there's probably nothing in between your ears. But God, his presence, his presence is here today. It was with you yesterday. Whether we recognize it or not, it will be with us tomorrow. Let's not go another day without recognizing his presence. You're the God of signs and the God of wonders. If you will it, what can stop it? What can stop the will of God? Nothing can stop the will of God. This, this world ends just like it ends in the Bible. He's already told us ahead of time how it's going to end. It's going to end just that way. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 4 says, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. The gifts of the Holy Spirit that we walk in, he's given us according to his will. Acts 7.36, he brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red, in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. He has been showing signs and wonders. He continues to show us signs and wonders if we'll just see them. Because you're working it all for good. Yeah, you're working it all for good. Psalms 107, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. God is good. Someone say, God is good. All the time. God is good. Miracle after miracle. Open door after open door. Here it comes. So get ready for another one. Because another one is on the way. Miracle after miracle. See, we need to... Well, why, why does this song continue to repeat this stuff? Because we need to get it down in us. 
It needs to it needs to take over. We need to renew our mind to the idea of God does miracles and he does miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. He hasn't forgotten us. We need to quit depending upon everything we see in the world to take care of these situations that our life is in and recognize that God is sending miracle after miracle after miracle. No one person, no group of people can stop the will of God for your life. Here it comes, so get ready for another because another one is on the way. Another one, another one. Yeah, another one is on the way. Another one, another one, another one is on the way. Oh, keep believing. Don't lose our faith. Because see, without faith, it's impossible to please God. We must walk in faith. To be pleasing to God. We must walk in faith to see the things of God manifest in our lives. 2 Timothy 4, 7. The Apostle Paul says, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. See, we want, we want to get the crown of righteousness. Not for ourselves, but we want the crown so we can lay our crown before the feet of Jesus. It's on the way. Yes, it's coming. I can see it coming now. See, we need to see it by faith. Because if he told the sun when to rise, and it did. Genesis 1-3. God said, let there be light, and there was light. He will again. See, we need to believe for light in our situations. We may have situations, we have conditions, we may have areas of our lives that we're experiencing darkness and we need to believe for the light of God to come in and bring light into that situation, to bring hope into that situation. The way that happens is to begin speaking the word of God and having faith that God will do what God said he'll do. See, there was one time when I was a kid, my sister and I was out playing underneath a big diesel tank back Back then, they didn't use pumps and all that high dollar stuff. They put the diesel tank way up in the air, and they'd have a hose. And that hose, you put at the tractor, and it free flow. Well, underneath there was a workbench, and so we we're there playing with them. And my sister was real quiet. You know, she's a good girl. You know, I was a troublemaker. I was a, I was the one always in trouble, and and all these kinds of things. But really, I don't think I, I was, I was a troublemaker. I, I was just a victim. <laughs> she picks up this piece of pipe and creams me right in the head. And to the ground I went like a dirty shirt. Knocked me out, didn't you? You'll be, go ahead, repent in front of everybody. <laughs> Testify. <laughs> Believe me, I was sure glad I got some light after that. Because the lights went out. The lights went out. We weren't even in Georgia. He told a storm to be still, and it did. In Mark chapter 4, verse 39, Jesus told that storm, peace be still, and it calmed. See, maybe you're experiencing a storm. Maybe you have experienced a storm. Maybe there's a storm around the corner. But he spoke to the storm, and he said, be still, and the storm was still. We've got to build our faith, whatever it is. Yeah, you may be having an issue at work. You may be having an issue at home, but begin to speak, storm be still. Storm be still. And if he told the sea were to split, and it did, Genesis chapter 1, 6, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. He told the water where to split. He's the one who set where the water comes up to. Some of us have gone through things in our lives we thought we were about to drown. Maybe some of us went eye deep. Maybe some of us went plumb under. But God told the waters where to stop. He did it then. And even though you may feel like you're drowning today, he will do it again. See, I, I, I just don't know. I just don't know. Uh, 
Maybe I'm the only one that goes through this. Everything the, this song is saying, I experience this stuff in different areas of my life every day, and I have to speak the word. Speak the word. Every morning I wake up, my feet hit the ground. The devil says, oh, no. We better give him, we better show him our best show today. So I, I, get, I just get bombarded with it. So I just have to speak the word of God over it. Every day. Yeah, you'd think we'd get a day off from it, but we don't. We always need to speak the word of God. And he will again. And if he told the walls when to fall, and they did, he will again. Jude chapter 6 verse 20 talks about, the, about the, the walls of Jericho falling down. See, some of you have come up to a wall and you don't know what you're supposed to do about it. Maybe you're asking God to remove the wall. Maybe you're asking the Lord, say, Lord, this wall, I can't get around it. I can't go under it. I can't go over it. There's not a door in this wall. Lord, remove this wall. And you look down and there's a pick. You ask God to remove it. He's now provided you a way to remove it. Maybe there's a wall in your marriage. I don't know why I'm on marriage today, but I am. Maybe there's a wall. And you ask God to, to remove that wall. Well, maybe there's something he's made available for you to do. Just keep looking straight, husband and wife. And he told the chains when to break, and they did. And he will again. Sometimes we've been chained down by some things we don't want to be chained down to. Sometimes we've been shackled, and we haven't been able to move, and we haven't been able to have our being like we believe we should be able to, like God has for us. But he will again. The chains will break. And if he told the bones to come alive in Ezekiel chapter 37, if he told the bones to come alive, he will again. Maybe there are some areas of your life that, have, that are dead. You believe they're dead. Maybe they're buried. Maybe they're just plumb out of sight and you don't let anyone see what that, that dead area of your life is. Maybe you need to speak life back into them dead bones. Because if he brought bones to life before, he'll bring dead bones to life again. If you think just because you're 65 years old that your life's over, you need to speak some life into yourself. Because God's not done with you. If you suck an air, he's got a plan for you. He told the stone to roll away, and it did. And he will again. Nothing can block the opening for you. He told the grave to let him go, and it did. If we can't believe that God can tell the grave to let them go, then we've got a, another issue. Because one of these days, that we're going to be buried into a grave, most likely, if Jesus doesn't come back before then. And we need to be believing that he's going to tell that grave to let us go. Amen? I know our spirits are already with the Lord, but we're going to get a glorified body. And again and again and again, can I get the worship team to go ahead and come on up? We need to recognize the miracles in our lives, give God the credit, and begin to speak them over ourselves over and over again. Because that's what he does, miracle after miracle. Open door after open door. Here it comes, so get ready for another one. Get ready, get ready. Because he told the chains were to break, and they did, and he will again. He told the bones to come alive, and they did, and he will again. He told the stone to roll away, and it did, and he will again. He told the grave to let him go, and it did, and he will again, and again, and again. You just keep on doing it because another one is on the way. Most of the time, it's easy for us to receive Jesus as our Savior because we all want some fire insurance. Nobody wants to burn. But today we're going to go a little deeper. I'm seeking people who want to make Jesus the Lord of their life. The Lord of their life. 
simply means that we run the Word of God through every situation and every condition in our life. You know, we're not going to be able to do it 100% right off. We're going to grow in it. You know, some of us don't have any trouble growing, so let's grow in it. Why don't we grow in the Word of God? What does it mean? It means spiritually, mentally, physically, socially, and financially that we will yield our will to the will of God. We let Him be the Lord. So I want to ask everyone to stand with me because we're going to move into a worship song. I want to lead us in a prayer for those who want to receive Jesus as the Lord of their life. I want to ask everybody to pray with us. But for those who want Jesus to be the Lord of their life, I want to ask you right where you're at, don't be ashamed, don't be embarrassed. I want to ask you to raise your hand right where you're at. I want him to be Lord. I don't want him to be just be civil. See those hands. See those hands. Thank you. I don't want him to just be my Savior. I want him to be my Lord. And then after we pray this prayer, the worship team's going to Lead us in another song of worship. I'm going to come down here, down front. And if you'd like to be anointed with oil, I would love to anoint you with oil and agree with you that God's will be done in your life.